Uh, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, thanks to, um, to the um, S3 organizers. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, we just had a wonderful talk. I learned uh, um, at least two in very interesting things from that. And uh, I, I, I think, you know, when I go back, I, I will apply uh, non-convexity to, to my stuff because all the stuff here in this talk is going to be convex. Um, so uh, this is a uh, joint work with my uh, students and um, um, a postdoc, um, uh, a CAM assistant professor, Ernest Rhee, who graduated from Stanford uh, two years ago. Uh, he's, uh, Ernest Rhee is at UCLA at the moment. Um, so, um, uh, so the model is awfully sim uh, similar to the previous talk, uh, except here we're assuming convexity. Um, so let me first mention that um, uh, that this K is not um, a generic uh, non-empty non convex set, but it's cone. It's a closed convex cone. Um, and you're not going to see something distributed in this talk. Nonetheless, uh, lots of the techniques can be generalized to, to distributed things. Um, it amounts to, uh, for example, making changes to the matrix A. Uh, if your variable X um, or your data A is distributed, you can make cer certain changes so that you can refit the algorithm into the distributed setting. Uh, so what this talk is going to give you is uh, a first order iteration uh, that will have two interesting properties. One is it's going to parallelize, and it's going to parallelize in a way that you're going to get to linear speed up, um, as the theory will, will indicate. And then you can also parallelize it in a way you're going to go asynchronous. And also, um, when, you, when we talk about conic programming, um, there's something we cannot ignore, is that lots of conic programs don't have solutions. Um, they, they're either infeasible, or it's feasible but unbounded. The uh, objective can go to negative infinity. And it turns out the simple first order iteration um, also works in those cases. And I tell you why it works and what, what, what I mean by, by working. Okay. Um, so this is the one slide overview of the, um, the overall techniques. Um, because of convexity, we're able to um, build from the data an um, iteration where this operator t is going to be non-expensive. Um, you can, in this talk, you can equalize uh, non-expansiveness with, with convexity. And then um, we're going to skip the uh, existing results on the convergence rates, um, but we're going to focus on the structures. What kind of structures allow you to, um, to solve this problem in parallel, uh, in many, many agents? Um, and this structure is going to look uh, pretty simple. We're able to break this variable z into m blocks, and we're going to show that updating each block only cost about 1 m's of the cost of updating all variables. Uh, therefore, the subproblems are very simple. Um, then we, uh, the second part, are going to argue that using the same algorithm, um, you, um, the sequence is going to diverge in a very nice way when the problem doesn't have a solution. Um, when the, uh, when the conic program doesn't have a primal dual solution pair, you can argue will it show not only it diverges, but the sequence diverges to infinity. Uh, and, but the way it diverges tell you a whole lot. In, for example, it's going to tell you um, a separating hyperplane between the two non-intersecting sets. It can also tell you how to fix the problem so that it becomes feasible. Okay. Um, so uh, what is this T? Well, the T is existing. Uh, T is not new. Um, it comes out of Niels and Messiah. Uh, this is called Douglas Rashford splitting. The first two people were, uh, were the first um, people apply this to a uh, two-dimensional um, time, um, time evolution of um, PDEs. Uh, that's where the, where, name, where the name comes from. After about 15 years, uh, Niels and Messiah generalize it to uh, the operator setting. Uh, this operator is based on the proximal map. Um, many of you know this. Uh, which is the sum of two functions, where x is the input, the minimizer e, z is the output, and there's a parameter gamma that, that balances the two terms. When this gamma goes to infinity, uh, this term uh, diminishes, and you're going to find among the minimizer of z, uh, among the minimizer of h, the, the one that closes to x. When the gamma goes to zero, this term is going to uh, increase to infinity. Uh, have, the, have a weight increase to infinity, then you will find um, the, uh, a point within the domain of z that's closest to x. Right? So it's generalization to, uh, to projection. 
Um, so how do we, um, let's review this dot last rush first splitting. Um, it applies to the problem where you minimize um, the sum of two functions. And these functions can be indicator functions. And you're going to create an iteration that look like that. And this is z. It's not a typo. It's not x because x is hidden. Right? So it's a, it's, this z is a variable that had the same dimension as x but encodes both the primal information that's x and also the dual information, which are the subgradients of the two functions. So anyway, these, this is the, the exact definition of a dollar Um They the, um, awfully look similar to ADMM in the sense that it applied proximal of two functions separately. You first do the proximal of g, and then you extrapolate, and then do the proximal of f. Uh, once you have these two intermediate points, look at their difference, add the difference to z, and this looks awfully like a uh, dual update, but this is actually not a dual update. Um, so this iteration is equivalent to ADMM, but it has a very different form. So in fact, if you write the problem into the ADMM form, x will show up, but z will not show up. Okay? And there's an important reason that we do this in the Dallas Rushford in this more abstract setting, because um, this property, uh, the z has a better property than the primal dual variables in, the, in, in ADMM. Okay. And those properties are going to allow us to, to achieve um, parallelism and allows us to tell something about infeasible and the pathological problems. Okay. So let's apply Dallas Rushford to conic programming. Um, so as a reminder, we minimize min linear objective subject to two sets of constraints, the linear constraint and the cone constraint. Um, you just uh, uh, combine the linear constraint with the linear objective, uh, leave the cone constraint alone. Um, I use delta function to, to denote the indicator. So this is like two functions, and then you just uh, apply the last Rashford. Uh, then you get an algorithm, and this algorithm actually works. Um, if you write down the, the details, uh, every iteration you can first project to the cone constraint, and then uh, because this part is linear, in fact, if you can even make it quadratic. And then the second step is going to um, project to this linear affine, no, affine set. Okay. So what can you say about the cost? Well, it depends on the cone structure. If this cone is second-order cone, if this cone is a non-activity cone or other, many other structured cones, then the cost of this iteration um, is uh, n squared per iteration. At this um, a hose, this is not n cubed because you, um, you pre-factorize um, this matrix product. For example, cash, uh, the uh, Chodesky factors of this matrix. So you do it only once, and then you have very cheaper uh, later iterations. Now, this is not new um, because you can use, apply ADMM. We're going to recover this. And we have a work before ADMM gets popularized recently. We, we applied it to, um, and this is the work that uh, mostly happened at Columbia University, um, and, and Zewin did most of the work. He applied ADMM to, um, to semi-definite program. You end up getting the exact same algorithm. OK. Now, but it took us a fairly long time to realize this algorithm is very easy to parallelize. Um, oh, by the way, there are other choices of, uh, of splitting. Um, if you do not want to invert A transpose A, uh, you can apply linearized ADMM or apply primal dual splitting. Um, if you want to avoid the expensive projection to a semi-definite cone, you can apply the recent variation of Frank Wolf. And there are many other um, algorithms. Okay. So um, now let's come back to, to, to dollar rush for splitting. And it turns out a very nice uh, structure of dollar rush, rush for splitting, at least for um, for quadratic programming, at least for second-order cone program, is this um, decomposition um, structure. And here's a definition of, of the decomposition structure, which I call Corne friendly. It basically means that if you only update, if you only run this algorithm, but only update one block at a time, the cost of that update is one m of the cost of updating all blocks together. Right. So this, if you can do this, you can have linear speed up, basically. So let's read the definition. So suppose T is some kind of um, operator that iterates your, um, that, that defines the iteration. And then you, you, uh, you're given Z, and you only update the ice block of Z. Other than the ice block, all the other blocks remain the same. 
then this definition is, look at the compare the two costs. On the right hand side is the cost of standard update divided by m. m is number of blocks. And the left hand side is the cost of updating z to z plus. And also uh, updating any um, quantities you maintain in memory. Uh, for example, you might maintain a times z. If you update one block of z, you also need to update a times z. Okay? So it becomes important to sometimes design this maintain quantity so that this can, can possibly hold. If you re remove the, the maintained quantity, the, um, uh, this, this definition is going to be more restrictive and fewer examples are going to satisfy this. Um, so uh, last year we had a, a paper um, published in, the, in a new journal called uh, uh, Annals of Mathematics um, Theory and Applications. Um, so basically we look at um, splitting algorithms and realize there are uh, some kind of interesting combinations of operators. The splitting algorithm I just show you for conic program is um, going to do two things. It's going to project to the cone and then do some linear operation. So projection to cones can be simple. And linear operations are, of course, simple. But when you put them together, you get a, a whole operator. Is it still simple? It turns out it's still simple to decompose. And there are a bunch of rules that um, allow you to combine them. Okay. So uh, let's skip the details and let's uh, look at what kind of uh, Roughly speaking, what kind of application will have this kind of structure? Um, most of the convex image processing models, such as those based on total variation, um, convex portfolio optimization, or it can be non-convex too. Um, lots of the L1 based the problem. Um, almost all the conic programs accept SDPs with huge cones. Um, and there's a reason that's going to come in the next slide, why I cannot allow huge cones, but I can't allow lots of smaller cones. And most of the uh, um, empirical risk minimization problems, too. OK, now let's be concrete. Let's look at second order cone program and argue that although you have this nonlinear cone there, this dollar structure is still uh, perfectly decomposable. Okay. So this is the definition of second order cone. It's an n-dimensional um, vector, where the first component is greater or equal to the norm of the rest of the components. So it looks like an ice cream in 3D. All right, so applying to saying all the cone program, then the dot last Rashford operator, or the iteration can look like this. You're going to do some projection to the cones, and then you can apply some linear operator. And this linear operator, you can you know, factorize it, you can cache it. So this is no more than just multiplying certain matrix applied to the result of this projection plus a constant. Okay, so linear operator is not the part, not the difficulty. It's very easy to de uh, decompose a linear operator. The difficulty comes from the cones, because the cones are nonlinear. Well, the, if you have lots of smaller cones, then this decomposition is trivial because these cones are separable. You just project part of the variable to the corresponding cone, and they, the projection is separate. But what if you have one big cone, and that big cone, that projection, is a nonlinear operator that couples all the variables? Can you still decompose it? That's the question. So suppose we have a one big cone, their n is big. But it turns out projecting to second order cones and, or projecting to rotated second order cones has a very nice structure. It makes it look like almost linear. So if, you, if your input is x, you project to the cone, and that, this is what the output is going to look like. You can apply some uh, scalar, scalar multiplication to all the components. What's interesting is the first component is going to have a scalar, and the rest of the, rest of the component is going to have the same scalar beta. Alpha, beta, are scalars. And this alpha and beta both depend on x1, the value, and as well as the norm of the rest of the components. Okay, suppose n is huge. Well, if n is huge, I want to update these variables separately by different agents. Then calculating this two norm is going to be expensive. It's on, but I want something in O1. Well, it turns out if you only calculate this once and cache it, and keep it in the memory, but update it. Then you can show that the cost is 1. So you cache the two norm, and now you use some algorithm to change just one component, say xi. i can be anything between 1 and n. And then the, the cost of updating this variable given gamma is O1, and the cost of refreshing this gamma is also O1, because you already know the two norm. So that's why uh, second-order cones, although nonlinear, uh, still have the 
structures allow us to decompose it. Now, this principle actually goes to ro rotated second order clones. Uh, it principle goes to um, Douglas Rashford for quadratic programs in general. Okay. That's actually. Um, yeah, it's actually that, that is not in, uh, not important. Homogeneous degree one is not that important. Yeah, not not important. You can do do weighted clones. All right. Um, so um, by maintaining um, the two norm, um, projection is cheap. Therefore, um, the the operator that com compose a linear step to a, to a cheap operator is also corny friendly. You can decompose it. There's some details, but uh, it's easy to work out. Okay. So roughly speaking, we started with a Douglas Rushford operator, um, an iteration like that, and then. Um, because of this decomposability, we can do a coordinate descent or block coordinate descent. And in fact, it's however you want to divide the blocks. Uh, as long as they don't overlap, you can divide the blocks as, you know, as small as you want. OK, so coordinate descent can look like this. Um, you, every, every time you just choose one of the coordinates or one of the blocks, um, then you only update that block. And because um, it depends on how you choose the block, sometimes you might have to multiply the update by a, 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 a scalar. The scalar may be less than one, uh, maybe decreasing in some choices. Um, now, this is called block descent. Now, if you want to parallelize it, or you want to make it distributed, and then you're going to design the A uh, so that you're able to use P agents to do these block updates at the same time. So then these P agents going to jointly choose a subset of the blocks. And then they together collaboratively update all the blocks chosen. Um, this is pretty different. Uh, the analysis of this is pretty different from um, um, block quantity descent algorithms in, uh, in machine learning because this is essentially prima dual. And there's no um, objective monotonicity here. Um, the, uh, the convergence uh, is really based on the contraction to the to, to a fixed point instead of uh, minimizing some kind of ob objective. All right. Um, so I, I'm thinking, you know, how to uh, I was thinking how to uh, apply mean east recent result to make it this non-convex. Um, so anyway, so far it's parallelized, but now we're going to make it async. Um, going from parallelized but sync to parallelized async means that you allow um, faster agents. Or fast communication, you know, agents with faster communication to run more iterations, so they don't have to wait uh, the slowest agent to to finish before you move on to the next iteration. So here, um, shaded area means busy. Um, so this means you have three agents, and then all agents wait until the slowest agent three to finish before they all move on to the next iteration. Now this is important because in, in the analysis is because. Um, they can share data. They can update each other with the latest data at this moment. Okay. However, this is slow, not only because you have to wait, but also you have to use message passing or some global clock, um, as well as um, you know, congested communication to, sh to exchange data. Okay. Now, async means that you know, uh, any agent just finish something and immediately uh, do something else. Um, for example, look at agent one. When agent one finishes, well, agent two already finishes, so agent one uh, may already have the latest information from agent two, but agent one does not have the latest information from agent three because agent three is still working on the previous iterate. So it's somewhat chaotic uh, because all the uh, different uh, steps, different runs of iterates can overlap in time. Okay. Um, so the question is, um, um, will this kind of um, Computation converge, and if it does converge, will I need much more iterations? Right. Well, it obviously, you're going to finish more rounds of communication, but does that does it need more iterations? No, that's the question. All right. So um, moving from sync parallel to async parallel, in fact, the mathematical is not that difficult. Um, it's pretty much captured by just one set of equations. So let me uh, rewind uh, two slides and look at this. Well, this means uh, all agents pick up zk. Every agent just do some computation for some i. And I argue that doing it for some i is cheap. Uh, now, uh, what's, what's different is these agents 
going to continuously do something. And whenever an agent becomes free, it's going to pick up some coordinate and do this similar kind of com uh, computation, except now the input looks different. No longer zk, but it's zk minus some dk. dk is called delay. dk characterizes the staleness of the information you receive. Okay. So what it does is, um, when you become free, you go to the global memory or, or look at the communication, see what you have received, and, and, and then compute something based on what you received, and then commit the change to your local variable. This is what it looks like. Uh, but there are some notational difference when you go async first, um, because um, agents no longer complete iteration and start iteration at the same time. Therefore, we're going to increase k, increment k, k, whenever any agent completes an update. So you're going to have more k updates. And second, this thing, uh, this dk is not actually a scalar because it allows different components to have different ages. Well, that because they may locate it in different positions in, uh, in the network. Um, technically, if you code it in, in one computer, you do allow um, something called an unlocked reading and writing, as long as this reading and writing are atomic, uh, which means every double number is completely written or completely um, read. Okay. Um, so, so this this thing, you know, when we started doing it, uh, we saw this is this was pretty new, but it turns out it actually goes all the way to uh, to the to the late sixties. Uh, but there are some differences. There are like a four or five different kinds of um, async stuff. And they converge for different reasons, and the, uh, um, and the applications are therefore different. Um, before the 90s, um, lots of work basically applied this thing when T it has some very nice property. In fact, the T is contractive in some weighted L infinity norm. Um, they have lots of applications in combinatorial and discrete optimization. Uh, then about uh, Roughly uh, seven years ago, started with Hogwild, um, where the machine learning community uh, start to apply async to stochastic gradients, as well as um, block quantity descent algorithms. Um, there are some early assumptions, and then there are some um, fix, uh, recent fixes, to make it more general. Okay, um, and then uh, we did, did it in a different way. We um, didn't look at function value, um, function value minimization. We look at uh, non-expensive operator T in the standard two norm, which has many more applications. I'm going to mention some of those applications. Now, one specific thing I want to mention is if you have non-smooth term, you have non-smooth term, let's say non-smooth term in the block quantity descent because of L1 or a projection to a, to a compact set. Right? It turns out if you look at all the papers, none of those papers can, put, can include the async in, can include the proc in the async part. In other words, whenever you see a prox, you will have to stop some clock, lock some memory, and do the plot, do the prox before you can release that part. But only um, you, know, you can only do this so far in the uh, in the uh, operator setting using non-expensive operators. Uh, and there's a tech technicality, uh, important technicality there. And also, I want to mention uh, Ken Betts and uh, Einstein. Uh, Einstein is here. Uh, no, not here. Okay. Well, they have, have some very nice um, projective splitting algorithm. Uh, it turns out what's amazing is it's free of parameters. There's no parameter in, in, his, in his method. Right? Um, but you have to do procs on everything. Right? But there's no, no parameter. Uh, all of these have some parameters, have some step size or uh, uh, some, some, you know, um, um, what is called damping, um, diminishing step size involved. Um, but this. Uh, this algorithm, not necessarily fast, but it has no parameter. Um, and also this word async may also, uh, you're probably familiar with, uh, with it, in decentral, di discreted, distributed and decentralized computation, it also refers to random activation of nodes or of links. But this is not the same thing we're talking about here because um, those things do not allow delay. Those things do not, may not allow computation to overlap in time. Uh, so you still have a fixed set of slots, um, except in every slot, so only some nodes or links get activated. They also call this async. So anyway, uh, let me give you one sample. What kind of things can we guarantee? Uh, this, by the way, this is not the latest result, but this is the simplest to state. So if you have m blocks, you have an operator t, and you have m blocks of variables, and you, if you do know the uh, delay, maximum delay you can have, uh, and assume you randomly pick block each time, 
then you can have this very simple theorem, and this is the fourth theorem. And it says, you know, if T is non expensive and does have a solution, and the delays do not depend on the block chosen, which means the, um, the system or the, uh, the uh, problem are roughly um, um, load balanced, then this is the step size you choose. Under this step size, you're guaranteed to convert to a fixed point, even if there are many, many fixed points. Okay. And this, is, this also works in infinite dimensional Hilbert space. That's, that's separable. So this is, uh, this is not typo, this is uh, weak convergence. If finite dimensional, it's going to become stronger, uh, strong convergence. And you can also say rates about this. Question? Finite sample. Uh, if, I, if I do k equations, then can you bound the error as well? I can bound the gradient. I can bound like a, you know, the fixed point residual. Uh, there's a monotonicity going on here. And so uh, underneath this is a, a new Nyapola function, which where the first term is the, the distance in the, in the induced Hilbert norm uh, to, the, uh, to the solution set. Whereas the rest of the terms are the success of difference that characterize the history and it's a diminishing, there's a diminishing uh, um, coefficient in front of it. So in fact, this do does allow a certain kind of uh, unbounded delays. And that's uh, if, um, so it's here, if the unbounded delays is faster than t to the minus four in time. So uh, exponential delay, sub-Gaussian delay definitely gonna help, uh, definitely gonna work. Um, um, so what's interesting, the step size. You want the step size to be as close to one as possible. So the step size is, in the denominator, is tau divided by square root of the problem size. This tau is, you can think it as uh, linear in the number of machines you use. Square root of m is square root of the problem size. So what means is, even if this is a 40 coupled, 40 dense problem, as long as the problem is convex, you can make it into a non-expensive operator, and you don't have to think until using more than this number of agents. Okay, all right. And this is a result of sharp when, the, when m goes to infinity. Um, now, uh, in practice, you know, in fact, they use more machines. That's because um, they're going to be separable, or like a, approximately separable structures. For example, when you work on uh, machine learning problems on graph, um, every node only connected to a few neighbors. Um, which can allow you to basically divide by n, m instead of m, the, instead of square root of m. All right, um, so um, I'll, I'll save time. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just mentioned that you know, going to the fixed point and going to a non expensive fixed point operator, you can have lots of applications um, when, when everything's convex. Okay? Yeah? Sorry, so the reason I was asking about, um, I guess, finite sample rates was. So, so you said in the beginning that you can get up to linear speed of an asynchronous setting, right? But, um, which is true for what's happening within an iteration, but um, can you comment a little bit on how the delay process interacts with the number so of the number iterations? Of iterations. Okay, um, so we, uh, um, the, the detail of the analysis or rigorous proof is, is on our archive. We posted like uh, three days ago, um, and that was only for uh, let me say it, that was only for uh, contractions instead of a non-expensive. In other words, um, if you do machine learning, you need at least one of the terms to be strongly convex, and or have this, you know, a strongly convex-ish um, bounds. Um, and um, assuming that um, you can, um, assuming that, and you have have this kind of delays, um, p to the minus four. In other words, uh, the uh, longer delays are less likely to happen. T minus four is a probability, the decay of the tail probability of the decay. decay. Um, under this kind of decay, you can show that when M is big, when the problem is big, a fixed number of machines, uh, there's no iteration penalty. You're gonna, every iteration is gonna basically improve at similar quality as if you're doing sync. Okay. Um, but, but, but uh, 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 you know, in this non-expensive uh, setting, which allows a um, wider class of problems, we don't have, uh, we don't have a, uh, you know, a total linear speed up. We only have like per iteration linear uh, speed up. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, there's some applications of this A-ROC thing uh, based on a non-expensive operator. Um, 
minimizing a, a function or minimizing a function subject to bounds, um, several of the ERM models, um, kernel SVM example, and as well we do recover an async um, updates to uh, linear systems, um, which give you something slightly different from, uh, um, from the Cosmos algorithm. Anyway, um, so let's give you uh, some, some numerical results. Um, so um, we compared an, our async code on one machine with, with up to, I think with about um, 20 cores, uh, 20 physical cores. And we, can, we were comparing to another first order algorithm called SCS. SCS is an ADMM algorithm applied to the uh, homogeneous self doing bedding of conic program. Uh, it's pretty recent. On um, large problems, it compares really well uh, to these commercial software. Um, so we compared to that. Uh, this dashed uh, curve is the is the total time, the total solution time to reach a fixed um, accuracy um, of the uh, SCS. And, and then as we increase our um, thread, because our, our, actually our algorithm is also simpler than SCS because SCS uses self-doing betting. You have a bigger system to solve. We have a smaller system to solve. We didn't bother with self-doing betting. And I'm going to tell you why we, we don't have to bother with self-doing betting. Um, as we increase the number of threads, at least on that machine, we're going to actually see a linear speed up. Um, you know, this is a time that reduces almost linearly. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to share you, you the code. Um, oh, my time is over. Uh, uh, almost over. So I'll just tell you the result of the second part, which I did, never talked about so far. Um, so when you do a conic program, you have to think about um, what if the 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 problem is not, um, does not have a solution, and the many reason doesn't have a solution. Um, what happens is, I won't give you all the cases, but I can tell you that there are three dimensional, very simple examples, where, which fails all the existing solvers. This is a three dimensional rotated second order cone problem. Everything has integer uh, coefficients. So these problems do arrive in, in practice out of the uh, branch and bound, and out of the um, for example, um, polynomial optimization, they're going to reduce to SDPs and, and SOCPs of this kind of form. So anyway, um, these three commercial solvers, latest version failed. And I have another example where it's a different kind, where the problem is infeasible. And then, uh, except for one, and the other two um, basically says, you know, give wrong answers or fail. But what's, what's interesting is the simple Douglas Rushford algorithm in these infeasible cases will diverge, but the behavior diverges um, is very interesting. I'm going to tell you um, how to fix those problems. Um, this goes back to the 70s. Uh, for example, 79, um, these three people finally nailed a very interesting property using results uh, from before. Um, it says that, well, even though the sequence might diverge to infinity, the difference, successive difference between two iterates, actually converge to a vector. And this vector is pretty abstract. It's project, projection of zero the origin to some closure of some um, residual, um, fixed point residual operator. Okay. So anyway, what we did is we show, first to show the order of convergence, which is one over square root of the root of k. And then um, we deciphered, basically, this, um, this operator to, for the conic program. And then we developed, developed the following. So what you're going to do is you're going to run three Fallout Rashford iteration, which are very similar to one another, um, and simultaneously. Um, so, the, the, so one of them going to set c to 0, one of them going to set b to 0. And then using the results of these three, combine them, you are able to identify all the pathological cases. You are able to com compute a improving direction if this direction goes to infinity and drive your objective to negative infinity. And it will compute a separating hyperplane if there exists one. And for all the infeasible problems, they actually tell you the minimal fix you can do to the data so that they're going to restore feasibility. So we have a flow chart like this, but it's running three iterations at the same time. And we have some numerical results com basically compared to all the uh, um, um, interior point methods that, that based on the homogeneous self doing betting. Um, this paper is also online. Um, the code is very simple. Uh, you can code it up in like 20 minutes. We do not claim this is fast, but we claim this is reliable.
So for example, when, when we detect weakly infeasible uh, SDPs, we're not always successful, but much more successful than the existing uh, solvers. But we do need uh, lots of lots of iterations. Okay. Um, and this is also because we haven't parallelized this part of the algorithm. Um, if you want to detect a strongly um, infeasible SDPs, we have a different set of rules, which need uh, some kind of 100,000 iterations. Um, but you know, the detection is really reliable. Um, so let me finish it up. Um, so basically what I did was you know, showing that a very simple uh, dollash rashford algorithm, which is equivalent to ADMM, is first of all, it's parallelizable and uh, fully parallelizable for second order cone programs, rotated second order programs, as well as uh, some of the SDPs. Okay. And moreover, and this algorithm also works in the path for the pathological problems by telling you how to fix them, um, how to identify them and how to fix them. And all the results are, are online and some of them are already published. Uh, thank you. Well, this, this theorem tells you that if you have m much more blocks than the number of machines, you basically can still run the iteration with step size one. Although you have let all the agents to run in parallel and run in async, um, it doesn't tell you, it doesn't say that so you're gonna, the total amount of computation gonna be reduced. It does not say that. It only says that um, when M becomes big, this denominator goes to one which means you can use a step size like a 0.999. So this is the better, I mean, better guarantee on the conversion. Yes. Yeah. Right. It, it, well, in practice, what people um, basically found, I don't have one, like one slide somewhere disappeared. Oh, here. OK. In practice, um, the coding part, of course, and then the performance. You know, people do care about the final performance you get out of async. Right? If it's done correctly, uh, then you do get a significant speed up. So what I mean by correctly, well, first of all, you do need to know some of the theory, so you know why it converges. For example, if you have a problem, you do it in, in ADMM, um, it turns out you do need to know what, it, what is the hidden variable Z. Because right? otherwise, you do it, you parallelize it, it may not converge. And then the second thing is um, um, you need to know the step size. The step size does depend on the, uh, the delays. Um, but you know, when you have, uh, when the, when the subproblem is similar and when the, when the cores, the agents are similar, you basically use step size one. In fact, in, 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 in stochastic uh, optimization, sometimes you get better results. Because of the delay you introduce, sometimes look like you know, an answer of acceleration. Right? It resembles an answer of acceleration. So it may actually, you, you need fewer iteration to converge. We know that in most of the big data problems, I mean, this is not the case. Do you like know a technique to like balance the load so that uh, the delay doesn't depend on this uh, index? Oh, first of all, and I agree. Um, you know, delay do depend on IK. Even if everything is load balanced, everything's perfect and divided, delay depends on the first few IKs you choose. Right. So. That this, 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 this assumption is not practical. Well, but there are theoretical guarantees. Um, now, recently, there, there's work um, uh, that uh, delays can depend on IK and still have rigorous convergence proof. All right. um, and second of all, um, how do you try to uh, balance the delays so that it look like doesn't, does not depending on IK, just the low balance? Um, you know, for example, when you do a logistic regression um, on, say, document data, there are lots of non-zeros. When you have non one non-zero, it means that this word shows up in certain documents. Right? So different data sets are going to have a different number of non-zeros. You should not 
like count the data set indices, but instead of, but it should count the number of non-zeros instead. That'll give you a better load balance. Okay. Yeah, all right, thank you. <coughs>